Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today we're having a conversation with Ryan Korzak of Asheville Vedic Astrology and just having a one-to-one, -one, one astrologer to another about uh, several different topics um, that are uh, interesting for us astrologers and hopefully will be interesting for you well as somebody who comes to an astrologer. Hello, Ryan. How are you today? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Uh, doing doing excellently. The the weather's been a bit cold here. Yeah, we woke up to some snow this morning, so that's I like that myself. But <laughs> I, I do too. You know, over here in the UK, we don't really get a lot of snow, but I have a feeling it's 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 on the way really soon. Yeah, here this year, which will make uh, my son exceptionally excited. That's good. Good. Ryan, you know, we, we talked about a lot of things the last time we had a conversation, but I, I don't think we ever spoke about how, uh, what brought you to Vedic astrology and, and what made you interested in astrology in general. And I'd be really, really interested to hear, as I'm sure would um, everybody who visits this YouTube video. Yeah, well, um, astrology has always been somewhat in my life. Um, I've always been interested in uh, occult subjects. Uh, oddly enough, I remember when I was 13, I actually asked for an Aleister Crowley book for Christmas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and somehow, <You're> brave. <laughs> well, I don't know what, what prompted me. I mean, I, I had heard about him through uh, um, uh, my love of certain musicians, but... Uh, Ozzy Osbourne, you mean? Well, actually, Led Zeppelin. But <laughs> oh, okay. <great. laughs> but so I got that. I got one of his books, I think, 777, and right. I had what I was reading. And I, I can't even imagine why my parents even thought that that would be a good idea to give me that. But anyway, it didn't matter. But so I'd already had this interest in uh, occult things. And um, throughout high school, I started reading more um, books on how to meet your spirit guide and Western astrology books and all these sorts of things. And so it's always been there for me. Uh, but the more I got involved in meditation and yoga, and of course, this is after the occult and Crowley studies. Uh, once I started getting more involved in yoga, um, I read Autobiography of a Yogi and mm -hmm. began practicing uh, Kriya Yoga. And then um, I read those chapters in that book about outwitting the stars. And at that time, I had also uh, been studying massage therapy and various uh, health-related practices like Ayurveda. And I started going down that route first. So my first foray into Vedic sciences was number one, yoga and Ayurveda. But then I realized my degrees in psychology and philosophy, uh, people have always told me that I'm a good listener uh, and I should become a psychologist. So I started exploring more um, astrology. And the more I studied astrology, the more I started to see how amazing it was that you could look at planets or symbols on a piece of paper and be able to tell anything at all about the person sitting across from you. And so this started to get me, um, this started to pique my interest because really at first, even though I was interested in all these occult things, I have a very skeptical mind. Mm -hmm. So when I got involved in energetic healing, I thought that was total BS. I thought, nah, that's not going to work. But then I had some experiences I saw how it worked. When people started talking to me about astrology for real, not just reading uh, books when I was a teenager, I said, yeah, that's, I don't know about that. But then I started seeing it working. So essentially, it was a long process of just being naturally interested in occult things, psychological things, philosophical things, um, which got me into Vedic astrology in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you brought up an interesting thing there, and uh, not, not to put you on the spot with this, but you said you were um, a good listener. People always told you that you were a good counselor. So uh -huh. what planet in your chart do you think gives you that capacity? Um, I, believe, I believe it's Jupiter and Mercury together. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I, I think that's the case, well, just because I know what they represent, but aside from that is with Jupiter, it allows me to see the bigger picture and to help other people, I think, hopefully, see the bigger picture of their life. And with Mercury, it allows me to see multiple sides of an issue. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, I know we talked about the, the difference between 
doing Vedic astrology with tropical zodiac and sidereal zodiac. Well, I can see both sides of that issue. So that's why I try not to get in too big of an um, argument about that with people because I realize that everyone has their own particular way. So mm-hmm. I think it's Mercury and Jupiter, the capacity to, to listen with Jupiter, which does represent the ears, and Mercury to, to be able to relate and to see you know, both sides of a situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan and I had a conversation last time about uh, the whole tropical astrology versus Vedic astrology, I mean, sorry, sidereal astrology scenario, because Ryan and I work with a system that uses a tropical zodiac, um, a tropical system for the signs, Aries through Pisces, uh, but the nakshatras, the lunar mansions are calculated sidereally, whereas most people who work with Vedic astrology, or I should say many people who work with Vedic astrology, tend to use a sidereal system. And a lot of people, um, talk, there's a controversy between which is the right zodiac to use. Um, my personal philosophy, I have found, you know, since working with the tropical zodiac and sidereal nakshatras, it all just begins to make perfect sense to me, and I have found it to be much more accurate. Um, but other people who work with the sidereal zodiac are, are able to give accurate readings too. And, um, you know, Ryan, why do you think that is? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have my own take too, but. Yeah, it's. Um well, you, you did put me on a little bit of a spot there because this is something I've contemplated whether, mm-hmm. whether, whether our, people should just figure that out for themselves, <laughs> or 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 you know if I should share my ideas on why I think they both work. Well, I'll, I'll do a little bit of both, hopefully. Um, first of all, I think they both work because there is so much overlap between both systems, like we discussed previously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one person might be a Leo ascendant in one system, but then in the other system, their Atmakarka might be the sun, which are both going to show these strong solar influences. So there's the, the overlap. Um, however, I also have seen that when I'm looking at someone's chart, they're usually going to get the information that they are capable of getting. And what I mean by that is, if I look at someone's chart and I see that they have a a beautiful Jupiter, or if I see their ninth house is profoundly influencing uh, their first house by aspect or conjunction, or even their ascendant Lord, that that just naturally makes them more inclined to get good information. Mm -hmm. And so if it, if they have that chart, then they're going to be drawn towards the individuals or the the astrologers or the counselors who will be able to give them good information. Mm -hmm. Um, And if the astrologer is a terrible astrologer, if the astrologer doesn't know their techniques, that day they'll be able to tune right in and give the the best information. They'll be the best astrologer in the world to that person. Right, exactly. Yes. And and if someone has, has difficulty in their chart about getting good information, then it doesn't matter if they go to the best astrologer in the world or the person who has the most precise techniques or accurate techniques, that astrologer is not going to probably, they're either not going to give the best information or the person's not going to be able to hear it and interpret it well. Either way, it comes out the the same in the wash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my sense is there's more going on. There's a lot more going on. There's interaction between the astrologer and the client. There is the client's natural karma, which is why uh, chants to Ganesh, uh, prayers to Ganesh to Jupiter, that helps a person to get better information. It helps them to learn astrology better. And that's, I, I like to speak to that only because I don't want people to be locked into I don't want people to be locked into, okay, my chart says that I'm going to get terrible information, so therefore just forget it. What, right. what, I want, right. what, what I want people to do is to say, okay, my chart says more than likely I'm more inclined to not either hear the wisdom that I need or to get good information. So what can I do to help work with that? Maybe I'll do some chance to Ganesh. Maybe I'll get a statue of Ganesh. Maybe I'll start um, uh, being more generous, getting involved in charity. All these things can help strengthen Jupiter within Mm -hmm. a person's chart. So, and then just one, one more little bit. Oh, sure. The idea of why does it both, why can they both work? Well, I've shared some ideas uh, of why, but that is something I feel that an individual has to work out for themselves and how do you do that? Well, you can study astrology and you study the, the basic Vedic astrological principles 
because the principles that, that we use using the tropical zodiac are the same principles from Brihat Parashar, Horashastra, Jaimini, uh, Prajna Tantra, whatever it might be, that a more traditional Vedic astrologer is using. So learn all the good principles and then start looking at as many charts as possible. And I like a person to look at charts that they're not, um, that they're not personally identified with or caught up in. So that right. way they can see it more clearly. They'll get objective with it rather than subjective. Exactly. Yeah. And, and spend some years doing that and then meditate and contemplate. How can these both, if they do both work, how can these both work so well? And that's where the yogic aspect of it comes in because then you'll get direct insights as to what's going on that might not necessarily be locked so much into the numbers or the techniques or the, um, all these specific things we think have to work out. There's a bigger picture going on and we have to contemplate that and get our direct experience from that. That's, that's the best way I think to approach it. Exactly. And, and you said something really interesting. Um, well, several things that were interesting, but especially at the end, something that you touched on there, which is, you know, by its very nature, this, this universe we live in or this consciousness that we live in is dualistic by nature or even multi-layered by nature, right. right? But behind it, there's a unity. So, you know, you can be a sidereal astrologer, you can be a tropical astrologer, you can be somebody who just reads chicken bones, or um, I used to have a friend who used to, to uh, take, take change, you know, and, and, and take coins and, and do readings by, you know, looking at coins, and, and you can still get some, you know, pretty amazing information from that, because it's a manner of tapping in to the, um, you know, the signs and signals and understanding the universe that you're trying to relate to. Um, I, I often like to tell people um, that on a certain level, the planets are always having a relationship. They're always interacting with each other, regardless of if you're using a sidereal system or a tropical system. Jupiter is going to be by transit at the same distance from another planet as it is in one system and another system. So there's going to be some similarities there. And it's, it's all just a manner of interpreting. Right. And yeah. You bring up the good point about the the plants are always in relationship to each other, and that's that's even that's very specifically true when we think about transits as well, because whether you're using tropical or sidereal, um, those planets are still going to be transiting at the same time. So if, if your Saturn is in Virgo in one chart and in Leo in another chart, as long as you're using the same system with transits, that Saturn's still going to hit natal Saturn by transit yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, there is that overlap too. And what, what you said about living in the, the dualistic system or dualistic world, but an underlying unity, that brings up a, a couple good points because, uh, you know, with Vedic astrology, it is essentially reading omens. You know, we, mm -hmm. uh, Ernst Wilhelm just put out a new video on omens and um, I've done a, um, uh, an audio download course specifically on Prajna, which I entitled The Astrology of Omens. Mm -hmm. uh, because that is a reflection of what's going on with, within the world around you based on the planetary positions. And the reason I find this interesting is because sometimes you don't even need astrology, like you said, to get an answer to a question. If you just pay attention to what's going on around you, you know, sounds that you hear, things that you see, even, even the way you feel. And I think that's one of the most important aspects uh, mm -hmm. of Prajna astrology and omens is the clearer an astrologer is. If, say, you come to me and you ask me a question, and at that point in time I happen to be depressed or negative or anxious, and you ask me that question, that is, if, I, if I'm able to be aware of my inner state, that's part of the universe, and so I can, I can know that probably the response to that question is going to have more of a negative uh, outcome. Or if you come to me and I've just had an amazing meditation and everything's flowing well and I'm feeling happy and smiley and my Mercury and Jupiter are active rather than Mars and Saturn, and you ask me a question, I then know that by tuning into my own internal state that there's probably going to be a more positive outcome to that experience. Right. You know? So it, it's, it's, it's a much bigger system. <laughs> Exactly. You know, that's, that's a good lead in perhaps to the, uh, to the next question that I was going to ask you, which is, what is your favorite astrological technique to work with or techniques to work with? Right. Okay. Well, very good. And Prajna is one of them. <laughs> um, and, and Prajna, the system of astrology, again, is the idea that um, when there is a, a question that needs to be answered, then the client 
approaches an astrologer or calls an astrologer or emails the astrologer, sends the question, and then the moment the astrologer hears that question or reads that question, creates a chart for it. And within the moment that that chart was created lies the answer to that question. And I find Prajna astrology to be very accurate for a couple of reasons. Number one, it doesn't it doesn't require any guesswork in regards to birth time uh, or even location because you know exactly what time it is and you know exactly where you are as the astrologer. Number two, the best way Prajna works is um, that it requires the person to have tried to figure out everything on their own first. And this should be the way I think with all astrology, but they've done their best to figure out, okay, this is what's going on. I tried this, I tried this, but now I'm at a loss. I need some extra guidance. So it's at that time where they, they personally have tried everything. They don't know anymore that they ask someone else. So that means there's a, a strong intention to know the answer. And as long as someone only asks one or two questions using Prajna, you can look at a chart and you can say, okay, there's probably not going to be success here, or there might be success in six months, or um, here are the things that are going to get in your way, or here's where you're going to find support, because you read the chart just like you would read a normal birth chart. And um, a great book that I've been re-studying, uh, uh, Sarvarta Chintamani, Sarvarta Chintamani, yes. Um, it, it, in the beginning, he says that uh, horary astrology or Prajna astrology and um, regular astrology doing natal charts, they follow the same principles. So if you know how to do one, you know how to do the other. So as a system, uh, Prajna astrology is probably my favorite. As far as techniques, I, I know we briefly discussed this uh, via email, and I have to say, when I thought about it some more, um, I find that picking on one technique is often like a physicist just trying to find one equation and saying, okay, this is going to describe everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if you, if you want to launch a rocket, you can't just use one equation. There are multiple equations that you have to use. But if I was going to try to break it down to one technique, it would be the capacity to look at someone's chart and to look at, like if they want to know about, um, let's say, uh, if they want to know about marriage, or, if, or let's say their spouse, if they want to know about their spouse then what I would say is I need to look at their seventh house and, and gauge all the influences on that seventh house, the right. benefic, the strength. I would say look at the Lord of that seventh house, see where there's some overlap. Uh, look at the Karaka for spouse, you know, if it's a, um, a heterosexual male, Venus, um, heterosexual female, uh, Jupiter, uh, see how that lines up. And then Try to try to add them together. Try to try to see how they're going to work in an equation. And right. the way I break that down is the house represents the natural. What's the word? Um, the natural capacity the person has for relationship. Mm -hmm. The or or the, even the body of the partner. The seventh house lord deals with the capacity to relate consciously relate to that thing, mm -hmm. and the karaka represents. Um, like the archetypical energy of that person or thing that we're looking at. So all those things together will give you quite a detailed understanding of that area of the person's life. So as far as technique, that would be the one that I would think hands down works most of the time very well. Right. Right. And you know, and you touched on a few points there that I, you know, I kind of want to, um, to discuss a little bit further, which is, um, you know, as you were saying, different techniques will apply to different situations. You're going to be working with a different technique dependent upon who is coming to you, what types of questions that they're asking. If somebody's asking for predictions, you're going to be working with different things than you would be if somebody's going, I want to know why this is happening in my life, what the reasons for this are. You know, of course, on that scenario, you might be working a little bit with, uh, you know, with transits and things like that in order to backtrack and get an understanding of, different times of a person's life. And in that manner, astrologers, we're, we're somewhat like detectives. We're always looking for the clues or the hints as to, as to why something is a certain way. But different uh, types of questions call for different types of, um, you know, of techniques to be used. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, with what you just described there, the idea of, of prediction. Well, right. If we want to know about prediction, well, first of all, we need to see it, does, does this person have the capacity to achieve what they want, which would be kind of looking at those overall things we just discussed. But then 
for prediction, we would specifically go over to using the doshes with transit right. to see when are they going to get right. activated. Right. And um, if we want to know how a person is going to work with something, well, then we can start looking at the dignity uh, of the planets. Because, for example, using the seventh house Lord aspect, if the Lord of the seventh house is debilitated or if the Lord of the seventh house is in bad dignity, that's going to tell us that what's one of the problems you're going to have. It's going to be an innate weakness in relating to your spouse or making that kind of connection. Or if uh, that planetary Lord is in um, the Baladi Vashta of an infant state. Right. Well, that tells us that the person might be immature in regards to how they exactly. relate to the other person. Yeah. It, you know, or if it's in an adult state, then they know how to work with that karma in a more mature fashion. So you're right. There, there, there are numerous things to look at. And I, I, I think that one of the reasons astrology has such a problem being accepted um, across the board. Um, I mean, you know, it's accepted in India. And obviously there are plenty of uh, uh, intelligent individuals who, who understand how astrology works. But I think part of the problem is, is that people try to make it too simplistic. And, and when they try to read a chart too simplistically or they try to look at something and, and only focus on one area versus trying to have as many uh, viewpoints as possible to zoom in, then they start making mistakes. And then it's easy to say, yeah, astrology is stupid. It doesn't work. You exactly, know? exactly. So, I was just no, go ahead. I was, you, did, you brought up an interesting point, which kind of sparked something for me, which is, you know, I've always felt, um, I kind of think, do you remember the old Star Trek episodes where they used to play three-dimensional chess? Yes. I often think of Vedic astrology on those levels. There's always so many different things going on on several different layers. Right. And if you can understand it on all of those layers and recognize that it's, it's all of those things at the same time, because a human consciousness and what it's experiencing is so very you know, vast, uh, both in, in potential and both in its range of emotions within the moment um, in relation to whatever it's encountering within its, within its universe. Right. And that's, 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 you're right. And even if we just look at the emotional versus physical aspect of things, you know, someone can say, am I going to get married? And you can look at their chart and you can say, yeah, but you're not going to be happy being married, exactly. yes. you know, because the, the, the karma there is to get married, but also the emotional difficulty around marriage is there. Or you can say, um, uh, am I going to get married? And you can say, no, you're not, but you're really going to be fine with it. You might not be fine with it, but you're going to learn to be happy with it and, and, and appreciate that freedom. So that's why it's not just, you know, point A equals everything. You know, you have to look and see how the whole picture comes together. Exactly. You know, you, you've created a couple of good lead-ins to, to other things I wanted to talk about today. And the first of which is the concept of fate versus free will. Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, an individual coming to an astrologer um, well, one level on which to go into that uh, with is the fact that quite often as astrologers, at least I know I experience this, you'll have somebody who will come to you and what they're wanting more than anything else is to have you confirm their fantasy, mm -hmm. right? right. They're, they're going to ask you a question. If you're seeing that that question is not likely to come into being, there's no amount of telling them the truth that's going to make any difference. Right. You know, it's just a specific point. I remember somebody a couple of years ago who had split up with his fiance. And, you know, I, I, I could tell that it was not likely going to gel back together because he was coming at it from a traditional background where the family um, was really wanting him to get married. And she was coming at it from the background of going, well, I want to be with somebody because I'm having a good time. Right. And the <laughs> just, just weren't matching up. And yeah. so he was upset because his, his family was going to be upset. So he was, you know, dead set on the fact that he was, you know, going to be able to get back with this person. And no matter how much I told him, that was, you know, what he was going to focus on. Right. But sometimes a chart will show, much like what you were saying with, with the specific marriage case, you know, you can see that, yes, potentially you will get married if that's what you're wanting the answer to, but are you really going to be happy? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so... So what is it that you want? Do you want to align with how you're here as a human consciousness to harmonize with the universe and with your specific unique set of circumstances? Or do you want that other thing that you're desiring? And life, I think, you know, is, is perhaps a little bit of both, you know. So then comes the question of how much of our life is faded mm -hmm. and how much is free will and how much does free will influence um, our chart? And I'd love to hear your take on that too. 
Okay. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It's one that, you know, I contemplate often, you know, number one, because practicing yoga meditation, you know, there is the idea that we are able to rise above our karma, but also uh, one of my one of my most um, profound uh, teachers that I like to study is Ramana Maharshi, which deals with surrender and just, this is what's happening. Um, so it's something that I do contemplate a lot. And I, I do have, I can relate to many of the stories that you said about someone wanting to fulfill a particular agenda. And I can remember one particular time when uh, someone was writing to, to, to us and my secretary got the email and she's, um, she's in college and she knows a little bit about astrology. And I just, um, uh, her, her boyfriend is um, a fellow meditator that gets together with me. And I thought, well, we'll just uh, hire her to give her some extra cash and take care of my emails. And someone wrote to her one time and was talking about that same thing. You know, I, I've, I've been separated from my spouse. This terrible thing occurred. I know we're going to get back together. We're soulmates and went on and on. And she said to me, you know, I don't think I need astrology to tell this person that, you know, that's kind of a, that's a ridiculous thing to, to focus on. And so someone who's young in college, didn't even know astrology. Sometimes you don't need astrology to, to know that a person might just need to get some sort of uh, maybe counseling or help to deal with those sorts of things. So right. I know that's off, off the subject, but uh, it's fine. you know, that's, that's something that I've, I've seen over and over. And, and I do, I do actually tell people that I say, look, um, it sounds like you're a little obsessed with this. Um, I don't think that the information I'm going to give you will be helpful at all. I think you need to work through that issue. And sometimes they appreciate it. Sometimes they don't. But anyway, back to, um, back to the question of fate and free will. Well, there's a great quote that I heard the other day, and uh, it was that we cannot control the winds, but we can adjust our sails. Right. And that's the way I look at astrology is that the winds are going to blow, there's going to be storms, there's going to be sunny weather, but we can adjust our behavior to those things and make the best of it. Um, now, in my mind, when I look at someone's chart, I look to see how often something shows up in the chart. Confluence, yes. Yeah, the confluence. Yeah. So if I see like one woman's chart I was just looking at, I, I, was, I saw that number one, she has a particular gymony combination for severe um, debilitating illness. I saw that she was in the cycle of that gymony combination, uh, the um, dasha cycle. I looked at her birth chart. I saw that her sixth house um, had Saturn in it. I saw that uh, her Venus, which deals with the capacity to rejuvenate and the, the strength and luster of the body was debilitated. I saw all these things and I saw that this person was in a, um, a dasha, both Jaimini and uh, Parashara. And then I saw that this person's getting ready within a couple days to go into um, their Saturn return. And so for me, this was confluence that this illness, and this person does have a fairly serious illness. Um, this illness is, might not be something that the person can overcome. And do I say you know, get ready to check out. No, what I tell the person is, you know, this is what's happening with Saturn. It shows that you're going to have to, if you want to survive, you're going to have to work hard and take a lot of responsibility for your, um, for your illness, because that's what Saturn requires, taking responsibility for this area of life at this time. And if you can do that, there's a chance you'll make it through. But as an astrologer, I cannot give any kind of guarantees. It depends on how you work with it and also depends on what your personal path is. You know, exactly. what, and the path of the people around you, because this is the other part about astrology that's hard for people to swallow, is that negative things happen and positive things happen. And sometimes negative things result in positive growth in people we don't even know about. You know, I, I know one person who was experiencing severe loss, and it was overwhelming, just the amount of depression and sadness this person was experiencing. But because they experienced this loss, it brought them into more state of compassion for others, whereas before they were hard and they were difficult. It allowed them to see that life was um, more beautiful than they had been given. It, it actually resulted in an experience of being humbled and, and appreciating life in a, in a greater fashion. Right. So right. If this loss hadn't occurred, if, if they had not gotten involved with someone who was going to have this difficulty, they might not have made that growth. So the issue is, there's a, there's a much bigger picture going on than I think our limited minds as humans can understand. Right. But what I do know is that the thoughts, memories, actions, and habits that we hold right now, 
that they are creating our, our future experience, just like our birth chart is the reflection of all the thoughts, habits, and tendencies that we had up until the point we were born. So if we take responsibility now and start acknowledging what's going on and then changing the way we want to move forward, it's not going to make everything better, but it's going to start to shift it in a different direction. So in my mind, it's about learning to acknowledge where we've been and to see that the universe is filled with infinite possibilities. So even though we might be going in one direction, we can start to make the shift. And that shift might be slow, but as long as we keep going, we will be able to experience that in a couple of years or even in the next lifetime, however long it takes to kind of counteract or let that past karma um, exhaust itself. Uh, one last thing I would like to say. Oh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I can go on and on about oh, this stuff. Okay. Um, I get excited too, so I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite books um, is called Vasista's Yoga. And in this book, uh, it's a long book. It's a very thick book. I don't know if my copy is over by my bed, but it's a very thick book and it's a series of stories. And the whole point of the book is essentially that what the infinite consciousness essentially is what it is, <laughs> you know, so it's learning to make peace with life as it is. However, throughout the book, it, it often says that what we experience is the result of our mind and that, and that there are countless worlds within atoms. There are countless possibilities always available and accessible to us. So it's been in my mind that when it comes to remedial measures, what they do is they help us make like a quantum shift in our consciousness. Exactly. And yes. And so if we, if we make a quantum shift that, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be happier tomorrow, I'm going to, I'm going to, get along really well with my coworkers. If we tell ourselves that, or we do some sort of remedial measure that encourages that, that state of mind, then we wake up tomorrow, we've shifted maybe like a micron to that reality. And if we do that over days and years and months, we've shifted a centimeter, we've shifted an inch, we've shifted a foot into that reality. So it's in my mind that what, what remedial measures help us do is to help us make these tiny quantum shifts into almost what you might consider to be a, a whole different reality. And that's, that's a hard thing to get your mind around, but I think that's how it works. And I, I think that that's how fate and free will works, that we are in our, our fate right now based on our past experiences, but it is our free will that allows us to make a little bit of a shift if we want to. And the remedial measures can help with that. I, th I think you put it put it quite well, and you brought up an interesting point there when you were when you were talking about remedial measures, which is you know as an astrologer, I've always had a hard time uh, using the term your your sun is weak or this planet is weak and this planet is strong. I, I much prefer when I'm dealing with somebody to say you're it looks like you're having a hard time harmonizing with the energy of ah, the yeah. planet because really that's ultimately what it's about is the person is out of harmony. Without that, with that aspect of their existence, and so shifting, you know, shifting the consciousness is what I like to call it. Shifting the consciousness or the attitude towards that specific factor can help the person terrifically, you know. And um, you, you can tell, dependent upon who's coming to you, you know, just to give people a little bit of background, because I recognize there are probably who, people who aren't familiar that as Vedic astrologers, we will often offer people remedial measures if we see that there's a particular planet that is. Uh, that's not um, functioning quite as, as it could for them, or they're not connecting to that planet quite as well. Um, so based on the person, you can know, well, sh should I be you know, giving this person a mantra to work with, or should I just be giving this person some simple action you know, mm -hmm. to do? Like um, maybe their, their son is um, a little bit out of balance, you know, so they're, they're needing to you know, have, have some confidence. So you, you get them to do things that are getting them more out there in public. So they're, so they're working you know, with overcoming those factors that are there. And, and really, it's just about ultimately strengthening you know, the weaknesses, bolstering those weaknesses, and, and learning how to keep those strengths in balance so that they don't become, become imbalanced. Um, right. you know, in, in or, terms, go ahead. I mean, that, that's, just an, that's an excellent point. I, I think that the, the approaching astrology in that way is probably, in my mind, the best way to approach it. Because, you know, again, being a musician, if, if there's a particular thing I can't do on my guitar or my banjo, I don't say, oh, well, screw it, you know, I just can't do it. If I want to do it, then what, I, what do I do is I sit down and I practice a little bit every day trying to get that right until eventually 
it happens. It's the same thing with our planets. You know, if we have a weakness with diplomacy, if we have a weakness with Venus, well, we practice being more diplomatic. If we have uh, a weakness taking more initiative, we practice putting ourselves in situations that get us into more initiative. Is it comfortable? Are we going to like it? Is it going to be easy? No. But, you know, on, on a much higher level, why, why would you go to an astrologer just to have them tell you, um, uh, you know, you're terrible at taking initiative or, or you're undiplomatic? You know, you already know that. And that's, that's one of the things that does frustrate me a little bit <laughs> when it comes to, to astrology is that most people ha have wanted me to, to tell them what they already know or even when they come to uh, trying to figure out uh, which which system is right, the, the, or which zodiac is right, the tropical or sidereal, they'll make a comment like, um, well, uh, now I have to really rethink my whole life. And I'm thinking to myself, no, don't rethink your whole life because the fact that your zodiac changes is not going to change what you actually experience. Exactly, yes. You know, you need to find which, which, which of those charts actually makes more sense with your experience. So it's not that all of a sudden you change because your zodiac changes. <laughs> no, you're, you're still the same. It's just yeah. a different way of, of, of looking at things. You know, exactly. Before, before we shift to another topic, because I wanted to touch on another couple of topics, hopefully okay. before, we, before we move on, but I also wanted to say, you know, I've often gone over this concept in my mind, you know, of, of will, you know, our will versus universe's will, God's will, whatever it is that, that you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And you know, my, my take on it or my philosophy on it, you know, personally is that even when we're exercising our free will, that's the will of the universe or, or that's, that's God's will. Yeah, it can't, it can't not be. Exactly. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Right. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's, 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 that's a hard point to get across and to, to even understand. And I think that's why meditation and, and yoga is so important because if you sit down and contemplate that, you can actually, again, get a direct experience of that being true because almost every religious mystical tradition says that God is everything or mm -hmm. the divine consciousness is everything. Well, if that's the case, then everything, we are that too. And, and that, that's a profound meditative topic. If you sit down, I've done this many times, and it's my favorite theme is to sit down and ask, well, if, if God is everything, yet I am not the doer, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and I, I, I mean that, I know I, I, know I saw him, like I saw him being flippant, but I, I mean no, that I in a curious way. Yeah. You know, they say you're not the doer, yet God mm -hmm. is everything. All right, well, that doesn't make any sense. So, But it can make sense if you sit down and contemplate it. And then you realize that, the will of divine consciousness does flow through each one of us. And the clearer we are, the, the more capacity we have to interpret that divine will and, and interpret it, meaning act upon it or let it flow through, you know, in a particular way. Anyway, yes, I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. So, you know, another thing that I wanted to talk about is the concept of counseling, I don't want to say counseling versus prediction, but how counseling and prediction, um, you know, work with each other. What I personally find as an astrologer is that, you know, it's important for somebody, even if they're coming to me for a prediction, they're wanting to know, you know, if something is going to happen, if there's going to be a potential for this or for that, that it's also important that they understand the whys, not just the what's, you know, so why, why is it difficult for this to happen in your life? Why are you desiring this? You know, why, why is all of this going on in your life? Um, mm. I find much along the line of drawing relevance to the concept of, um, of if you're going to a doctor, you can, you can have that doctor just treat the symptom of the problem. But if you're not treating the symptom in addition to treating, treating the root cause of the issue, then the symptoms are just going to you know, eventually return or you're going to continue to deal with the symptom. All right. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a hard, hmm. That's a hard thing to consider, but I think that it, it, it comes with experience as an astrologer. And this is also one of the reasons why, um, you know, there are numerous astrologers out there. Uh, but I try to let people know that Personally, even though I have an interest in psychology and I have an interest in behavior change and all these sorts of things, that my role is not to do that for you. My role is to help you understand these are the possibilities to bring more awareness to where your weaknesses are and those things you need to work right. through. And then you yourself need to find someone, a, a professional, to help you do that. 
Right. Um, I, I do think there are plenty of astrologers out there who can do that. So it's not that I'm saying an astrologer shouldn't do that. It just depends on our, our level of training. Um, but I find it hard because just like across the board with normal population of uh, people who go to medical doctors, well, a lot of people do just want a drug or they do just want uh, a symptom to be fixed. And that's fine because sometimes we can't think about um, we can't think about fixing the problem until we can get a handle on the symptom. And you know, I have a great story about that myself, where I had a, a health issue during uh, my Saturn return that um, was just unbearable, would not go away. And I I was hell bent on uh, doing Ayurveda and doing all the natural healthcare things, and I just got worse and worse and worse. And finally, my guru said, uh, or my spiritual teacher at the time said, um, you know, you're not getting extra points for suffering. Why don't you just go to a doctor, <laughs> like a, a medical doctor? And so I went to a medical doctor and I got some kind of prescription that uh, cost like five bucks. And within three days, this issue that had been killing me for two years essentially was gone. But what that did was, is it allowed me to then, all right, start thinking about what were the behaviors, what were the thoughts, what were the actions that led me to that problem. So I think that right. there's a fine line between we do need to treat the symptoms so that a person can kind of focus on the issue uh, and how to address it. But also we need to be able to look at and ask if a client really wants to um, go into the work that might be required to make that kind of a change. And I do that sometimes. Uh, if I get questions that I know, I look at the chart and I see they're very heavy questions and they're going to require a lot of th um, thought and different kinds of activity on the client's part. I'll say, look, before we do this session, um, this may require that you have to challenge a lot of your core beliefs and this may require that you have to do a lot of work before you can have success in what you're asking me about. So if you're not interested in that, it might not be a good idea to have this session. If you want, you might want to find another astrologer. If you are, then I, I'm happy to talk about these things with you. So there's this interplay between number one, what are, what is the astrologer's capacity as an astrologer? Right. And number two, what is the client's capacity? Um, what is the client's capacity and, and what are they willing to do themselves? Which, you know, that's, that's, that's life though. You know, that kind of interplay and that interaction that you have. Exactly. And, and I agree with you. I, th I think both are important to understand. I do find it's important to treat the symptoms. And, you know, I, I, I function much in the same way you do along those lines, which is, you know, it's, it's always good to let the client know if they're going to, you know, need to be doing some self-work, ask, checking in with them, seeing if they're willing to do the self-work. It's always up right. to what the, what the client is interested in doing. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yes. So, uh, Ryan, um, I'm a little bit out of time for today. Okay. I had a lot more time to talk because every right. time you and I have a conversation, I feel that I could just go on for like a good hour and a half or so with this. But uh, it's, it's been wonderful talking with you today and, uh, you and having the communication. And I'd, I'd love to have another communication some point in the future. Sure. Um, yeah, it's on the camera or off the camera, either way is fine. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so uh, wonderful connecting with you, Ryan. Ryan, can you can you tell people? And I'm obviously going to put this on the video, but can you tell people your website address and also how sure. to get in contact with you? Yeah, my website address is AshevilleVedicAstrology.com, um, and you want to go to I believe it's the the schedule uh, schedule schedule a session page and that'll give you the, uh, the email address for, um, uh, for my secretary, uh, astro info at Asheville And if you do write, you know, please have some patience, give me some time in, in response or Emily some time in response. And uh, that's the best way to do it. So Asheville and then astro info at Asheville Wonderful. Thanks Ryan. It's, it's been a real pleasure uh, talking with you today and, uh, and, Hoping we can, we can do this again sometime. Excellent. It's been a pleasure talking to you too. Thank you very much, okay. Michael. Take care of yourself. Okay, you too.